Okay, Stetson, so are you ready to get started? Yes. Fine. Okay. Well, Stetson, first of all, I want to thank you so much for the honor of, of being of sitting with us and doing well, the interview. I really appreciate it. The honor is all of mine. I, 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 it's mutual. All right. it's, uh, I'm very glad to see you here. Well, Stetson, people have, have interviewed you over the years on a lot of different topics, and I thought today, if you wouldn't mind, we could talk about your books and the, the impact your books have had, and maybe we could start with Palmetto Country. Um, this was a book when it first came out, and I was just amazed rereading this book. Uh -huh. You know, when you, when you published it, I think originally in 1942. That's correct. And you had the first chapters which challenged that old, the old racist history reconstruction. That's true. You know, where you actually celebrate the democratic experiment uh, of reconstruction. Yeah. Could you tell me how you went about writing those? Well, uh, you, you mentioned the, my reconstructing, reconstruction, the, the traditional, conventional uh, birth of a nation uh, the concepts of, of reconstruction are very, very badly in need of uh, fixing. And uh, I recall that my father, when he first read the book, they were all excited, you know, about a member of the family who's written a book. And so my father says, good job, son. He says, the Yankees will believe every word of it. <laughs> and and uh, we Southerners will know the truth when we see it. So it was, I got that kind of reaction uh, from my father, from one of my aunts. Uh, uh, she said, uh, all I've got to say, if anybody who wants N-words to rule them, ought to have you know, N-words to rule them. And of course, we didn't use N-word in those days. And another one said, well, we can't expect Stetson to understand the problem of the South because he, he was born in Florida. And uh, of course, Florida being outside the, the Southern plantation uh, system to a large extent. Anyway, that was the kind of reaction I got in, inside the family. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I couldn't remember what I'd said that had them so uh, so upset, you know. But apparently in 42, that was, uh, uh, you know, pretty revolutionary stuff. Yeah, because you were a pioneer in that. Because even the state, even what was taught at the University of Florida yeah. was completely different. And what was taught there was yeah. that the noble... South had been defeated. The carpetbaggers came and took over and everything. And I'm just kind of wondering where you got the wherewithal to write against what all the academics were saying. Well, the first step is realizing that not everything they're saying is true. You know, as a kid, uh, I decided already that uh, grown-ups were lying about a whole lot more than Santa Claus. So when you apply that to the classroom, and other public forums, uh, you you can uh, see through a lot of things, and and uh, you know one thing leads to another. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, this is a major interest of mine that I've j just established an award at the Florida Historical Society for the best book of the year in investigative uh, history. Uh, Dr. Jones at uh, FSU said that. I might go down as the first investigative historian and uh, with a view to encouraging that to happen, uh, I've established this annual award at the Florida Historical Society uh, to anyone who deals with neglected or covered up aspects of history. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the same way in, in the Oral History Association, the National I've established an annual award uh, for the same sort of thing of persons or institutions which uh, uh, do outstanding work in, in taking oral histories from people on the cutting edge of social change. Mm -hmm. Stetson, one of the things that, you know, you've established these awards, but as you know, it is so hard to write against the grain because you have this big structure. And there was this grand jury that just met 
and it was looking at Florida politics. And I don't know if you heard about this, but they met, they, they convened for a couple of months, and then they, they put out this, this statement. They said that today, in 2011, the Florida political system is corrupt from top to bottom on all levels of state, local, municipal government. And yet, <laughs> the thing that strikes me, you can't get historians to write about it. You know, they want to say that, well, the system works, and but the system as you've shown in your books, doesn't work. And I'm kind of wondering, when you were starting out writing, did you get any support in, in what you were saying? Or was it all kind of, did you feel like you were kind of isolated? Well, I, I made it a point not to speak to academics. Okay. Or get back in the sex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. I recall Erskine Cole, uh, he apparently went out of his way to uh, he discovered me, so to speak, and invited me to write Palmetto Country uh, because of a, a, a short story, a documentary. It was really oral history about a lynching in Key West. It, uh, it was published in Direction magazine, and uh, Caldwell was one of the judges. And on, because of that uh, piece, he invited me to write this, write the book. And I recall along the way, I was busy, you know, age 20 or whatever, uh, typing a whole lot of quotations from other people. So he wrote back, says, be your own authority. <laughs> Stop quoting. So you, you tell an academician, uh, be your own authority, and you, you know what sort of looks you'd get. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, Governor Bloxa well, might be upset. You know, I did. Or, I did. And I guess I got away with a lot of it, and uh -huh. uh, which reminds me, in Paris, the uh, French edition of my Jim Crow Guide, published by Jean Paul Sartre, uh, a yuppie little CIA agent came to see me, waving it in my face, and saying, "This thing hurts like hell," and. Uh, that if you'll just re re repudiate it and say it was a put-up job, we'll make you financially independent for life. You imagine that? Uh, so I said, I said, well, if you can point to any error in it, I'll be happy to correct it for free. But he took, he left, and I called a press conference to you know expose the thing. Uh -huh. So I've been poor ever since. <laughs> Stetson, could you talk a little bit about, you know, I've been thinking about Erskine Caldwell and Tobacco Road, and I mean, could you talk a little bit about him, what, what he was like? My uh, father had a furniture store in Jacksonville, and one of his uh, salesman collectors, I worked with him closely in the back alleys collecting dollar bills, um, made the remark, his, his family, he said, lives on Tobacco Road, and it, Caldwell got he said all of his stuff, uh, tobacco road stuff, from this fellow's father. And I uh, said, so you never know whether it's true or not, but uh, that's what he said and made such other remarks as, Caldwell knows he'd better, if he, any time he crosses Georgia, he'd be 40, better be at an altitude of 40,000 feet. <laughs> 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 so, but uh, the collection of letters that Caldwell were coaching me as we went along, mm -hmm. I recall I had, uh, it was published by Duell, Sloan and Pierce, a quite a respectable publishing firm at that time. And the manuscript came back to me from the publisher with all sorts of red ink uh, notations and so on. And I'd said that the uh, houses of prostitution on Houston Street in Jacksonville, the going rate was $2 and a special student rate, one dollar. And uh, the editors had put big red question marks there. So uh, by the time I got it, Caldwell had scratched out all the question marks and wrote, you know damn well they do. <laughs> 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 so it stayed in, I think. Uh -huh. But uh, I was going to say that uh, the collection of his letters uh, to me uh, was apparently a unique, uh, discreet collection. He never did that for anyone else but me. Mm -hmm. So the University of Georgia purchased them from me, and those letters may be found there in the library. Mm -hmm. 
Caldwell seems like it seems like Caldwell was a good editor of this series. Yeah. Uh, after he had invited me to, you know, write the book, I said, "Well, where where are your guidelines? What what what, what are we supposed to go by?" Well, he said, "I don't have any." I said, "Well, uh, the series ought to have some kind of cohesion." Uh, he said, "Well, I don't I don't have anything." So I sat down and wrote about a seven-page uh, prospectus on what I thought the series. Uh, the, the nature of it, and the scope of it, and uh, so forth. And I sent it to him, and uh, lo and behold, he sent it to all he, all subsequent authors mm -hmm. were given this thing that I'd written. But uh, he he had no preconceived notions of what he wanted. Yeah. He actually told me, uh, "Don't think I'm telling secrets on him." He, uh, that he was disappointed in the series, and, and that probably only three or four of them should have been published. Mm -hmm. And that mine uh, was a book to be proud of. Mm -hmm. So all that was gratifying. Stetson, what, what did you think about Caldwell's short stories? You know, he was known for the novels and everything. But yeah, it's been a long time since I... You know, I was impressed at the time, and I guess I still would be. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they reflect a southern tradition of telling stark, uh, dabbling in blood and guts, as though they were talking about uh, cooking greens or something, you know, mm -hmm. and all in one breath and, and, and not much punctuation. But after you finish cutting, cutting her head off, you start trying to work on her toes or something, and blah, 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 blah yeah. without any emotion at all, you know. <clears throat> so this is, I think Carl was doing some things in that tradition that. You know, you just start telling of things that, and no playing around with it. Yeah. We well, you know there's another writer I wanted to ask you about, Stetson, before we move to your next book, and that was um, a woman by the name of Lillian Smith, who I, I also admire greatly. Lillian Smith? Lillian Smith. Who? Um, she wrote Killers of the Dream, um, and she also was from Florida. I think she was originally from Jasper. <clears throat> and... There's a story I've heard you tell about her where uh, when Theodore Bilbo was on his deathbed, he was saying that he didn't want to go because there's two people who are ruining the South. One of them was Stetson Kennedy and the other's Lillian Smith. Uh, my memory plays tricks on me about okay. the other sure. name. Uh, that's very interesting. She had set up a school in Georgia uh, where black and white kids would go together. You're not saying Lillian Smith, are you? Yeah, yeah, Lillian Smith. Huh? Lillian Smith. Yeah. Well, yeah, I can talk about Lillian Smith. Okay. Uh, we were, to the best of my knowledge, the only two uh, Southern and white book writers, authors, uh, who were crossing swords publicly with Jim, the Jim Crow system. Mm -hmm. And yes, she had a place in North Georgia where uh, black and white people and kids came on weekends and and workshops and so forth. Um, she, she edited with Paula Snelling a magazine and uh, addressing uh, segregation among a lot of other things. But as it, in those days, uh, my recollection is that uh, she was she was describing racism uh -huh. to a psychological uh, uh, aberration on the part of us whites. Narcissism, uh, she, she said, is what it amounted to. Uh -huh. And if we just stop looking at things that way, racism would go away. So there's a problem in psychology. And that never did strike me as having much merit. Uh, it may be one little aspect of, of uh, the whole thing, but it's far more complex than any thing about thinking white is beautiful and black is ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, ideologically, we cross swords somewhere uh, about about segregation, and it was published in the magazine Common Ground, 
and attracted some attention. Um, later on, I gather after I'd left Georgia, uh, well, when I was there, she was, my memory tells me she was very reluctant to sign petitions or write letters or work with any organization. Uh, so we felt that as, as an activist, she was not uh, doing enough, if anything. Mm -hmm. But I have to uh, footnote that by saying I understand in the later years she did become very active. Yeah. But uh, there's one uh, anecdote I can tell you. Uh, Senator Theodore Bilbo of Mississippi was on his deathbed uh, waiting surgery for cancer of the throat. And he called a press conference. And at that press conference, he waved a copy of Lillian Smith's I think strange fruit, and uh, my uh, southern exposure. And he said to the press, he said, I much prefer the throat cutting style of the surgeon, the vertical, vertical style. These two books are they're trying to cut my throat horizontally. <laughs> right. So I have the clippings, uh -huh. and it's uh, something else, you know, it's a sign of those times. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Southern Exposure Stats. And you have, I'm looking at the, uh, a copy of the book, and there's a quote from the Boston Chronicle from the review. It says, as Uncle Tom's cabin became one of the greatest single forces in the eventual overthrow of slavery, so can Southern Exposure play a major role in freeing the country of segregation. Mm. What, what was your goal in writing this, in, in writing Southern Exposure? Well, the publication date, let's see, was 42. Um, is that correct? No. Uh, it was, yeah, Palmetto, Palmetto Country was 42. Yeah, 42 and then... uh, Southern Exposure was 46. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> the history of the writing of that book, I went back to the beginning of World War II. And uh, at that time, uh, President Roosevelt had proclaimed that the or aim of the Allies was to establish the four freedoms for all the people of the earth. And of course, nowadays you, you could you'd be hard put to find anyone who could name the four freedoms: the speech and religion, and from want and fear. And of course, that's a, a societal order, and probably will never be achieved. But anyway. I thought it was something to hinge your book on, mm -hmm. and I started off writing under the working title of The Four Freedoms Down South. But everyone forgot about The Four Freedoms so, so rapidly they didn't even wait for the war to end <laughs> immediately, you know. So no one knew what I was talking about. So I ended up with the title Southern Exposure, and using some of the material from the earlier manuscript. And it was written in large part in Miami, as I recall, in a garage apartment. Uh, Paul George, the historian, has a walking tour, and he says, that, that garage apartment back there, it's, it burned recently, half, half burned. That's where Stetson wrote Southern Exposure. Oh. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, yeah, the, I took the war very seriously. Uh -huh. in, in terms of uh, what the outcome, everyone on the earth, all the leaders from the Pope to the, uh, all pot kinds of potentates and labor leaders, everybody was busy writing on what we were fighting for, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, I sent a large collection of it. I don't know if anyone on earth collected it but me. Sent it unannounced to the New York Public Library. And I got received an indignant letter back, sending it, returning it to me. They don't ever submit anything to us without being uh, querying this first, you know. So. Mm. Oh, the material that went into the book, the research. That material, well, the uh, research. It's been so long ago. I, I don't recall the details uh, about the research. Um, we well, you know Stetson again. One of the things that strikes me about about Southern Exposure, like uh, your earlier book, is you have. I mean, if you look at the chapters, I mean, one of the things you argued in this book was that 
when you say the problem of the South, you talked a lot about, and you were one of the first people to do this, Northern corporations, Northern capital coming in. I think you may even have used the term colonialism, the way that they came in and really took over the economy. And so you talk, and, and what you do with this is you talk about racism as a national problem, you know, not just something that, that's in the South. Well, I, I try every time, I, you know, almost every, at every opportunity to make the point that this is true, not only in the South, but the entire nation. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was, that's been a constant uh, point with me in all of my writing. Uh, Southern Exposure was something of a sequel or a follow-up to a book called Undercover by John Roy Carlson. In the beginning of the war, he infiltrated in the New York, New Jersey area, various uh, Italian and German and Nazi fascist uh, groups and uh, exposed them in that book, uh, Undercover, and it was a bestseller. So this was going to be a Southern version of Undercover. And uh, that's, that's how it was born. Uh-huh. And, uh, I proceeded to infiltrate all these various organizations, including Clans, which had put away their robes for fear of being prosecuted uh, by Roosevelt under the War Powers Act. They were scared to death to do anything in robes. So they put away their robes and took all these other different names, mm-hmm. same leaders, same everything, except that uh, they didn't use the word Klan. And so I was very busy. All of those organizations, you have, you have it front, your pages have a frontispiece now. Uh, 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 the original frontispiece had scores of uh, logos of, of the various uh, Oh, okay, factors. yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't think this version... So that, that was a, a major focus of the, of the book. Now, beyond that, uh, the South at that time... Uh, it was on all the maps of the hunger areas of the world. Mm-hmm. The American South was a hunger area. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, going to be described as a feudalistic, uh, racist, oligarchic, uh, uh, you know, a horrendous example of white rule. Uh, the electorate uh, hovering around 20% because the the polls act kept poor whites from voting. It was cumulative in many places. Mm-hmm. And the white primary totally barred blacks from any meaningful vote. Mm-hmm. So the, it, was just, it was far from being a democracy. Yeah. And so that was what uh, I was inveighing against. I remember uh, one critic, I forget which one, said that anger against injustice of every kind, flickers like a blue flame from every page. I'm talking about my southern exposure. Mm. And uh, I like to think there was some truth in that. Mm -hmm. Uh, The context of uh, historians have, for some reason, chosen to ignore what, in my opinion, whether the most significant milepost in the uh, attack upon transition uh, uh, from uh, segregation to, to desegregation, which reminds me, I've been telling my audience this, that where once we had segregated racism, we now have desegregated racism. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, some things happened in, in that period, and one of them was um, a Durham statement, in effect, a manifesto. Oh, yeah. And uh, that Durham statement is like raising a standard, you know, which all men of goodwill could repair, uh, set forth, the, you know, the totality of black Americans to, to, to want to be treated just like everybody else. They don't want any, any black republic or anything else. They want to just be treated like everybody else. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I had the personal experience of W.T. Couch, uh, was uh, publisher of the Chapel Hill University of North Carolina Press. Mm-hmm. And 
he was also Southeastern director for the Writers Project. So I had some contact with him. I recall we asked him why he didn't have any African Americans on his staff. He said, well, I, you know, the old standard thing, I would if I could just find a qualified one. So that was the kind of fellow Couch was. And when I challenged him to, to make, make a statement for publication in the book, uh -huh. he proceeded to write one. In which he says that you have to make up your mind that if you believe in majority rule, and then you have to uh, believe in the right of the white Southern majority to impose segregation upon African Americans. So he, under the majority rule, of course, at that time there was an extensive black belt, uh, states and counties uh, all mm -hmm. running across the South. So I don't know what, you know, and the Confederacy no longer existed, so I don't know where they, they got the politics that he had in mind when they had a white majority. Yeah. Uh, it, it was in a position to vote on the six things. Anyway. Well, one of the arguments you make in Southern Exposure, Stetson, which, again, was so far ahead of its time, was your, if I understand your argument in this book, it's that racism costs the entire society dearly. You know, it's primarily aimed at black people uh, or Mexicans, but that it ends up making the South into a region that's more poor, where a lot of people are going hungry, and that the only advantage you may have as a white person is you're white, but that's not going to put food on your table. Well, the standard contention, I think there's a lot of truth in it, is that uh, the fact that you pay black workers less than white means that you can pay the rock bottom wage to the blacks. And pretty close to the same thing for poor whites. And that depressed the wage level, not only in the South, but throughout the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. that, if whites complain about something, and the boss would just say, well, if you don't like your job, I'll quit and I'll hire blacks. A lot cheaper. So that was a reality. Um, there was another mile post of the publication of a report called Nation's Number One Problem, meaning the South. And it too spelled out, uh, you know, these many uh, horrors, really, that had the South was in need of addressing. And uh, that, that uh, little book was, uh, had a tremendous impact. I was going to say that Couch thought he had the bright idea of selecting, uh, say, so-called hanky heads, uh, uh, African-American college presidents and so on, who were dependent upon uh, corporate uh, fund funding, mm -hmm. I invite them to write a, each one write an essay. And uh, he hoped to get essays in which these uh, selected people would say, well, all we are asking is equal opportunity. We're not interested in this social equality thing. Uh, it's uh, equal opportunity. But all in all, all I have about 16 of them, I suppose. Each and every one of them said, we've got to go all the way. <laughs> so, so Couch was stuck with all these manuscripts and nothing to do but uh, publish them. So these, the Durham Statement and, and, and the Couch Book of, we called it What the Negro Wants. And lo and behold, they wanted the whole, whole long. And uh, so he died a disappointed man, I suppose. <laughs> right, Couch. <laughs> Could you, um, Stetson, I wanted to talk about your next, one of your next books, but you made a statement I wanted to see if I could get you to amplify a little more, which is desegregated racism. And, and I've heard you mention this before, but uh -huh. what do you mean by desegregated racism? What, what, what is it? Most people say, hey, once you get desegregation, racism is over. Yeah. But what do you... The expression of post-racism. Uh, post oh. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, I was uh, here in St. Augustine when the 64 law was passed, and I got up the next morning and... Saw a black lad on a bike 
Kathleen away, and I said to myself, well, as far as I'm concerned, you're on your own now, and you're on the same legal standing as any other minority in America, and I'm going to work on other subjects. You know, I've, I've been working on this subject, uh, I don't know what the years were, I was 64, and I've been working on it since I was uh, uh, 20 years old. So that's, that's, that's a long time to be working on one subject. Uh, and that's not, of course, entirely true, but I was, you know, very largely focused on things having to do with race. And uh, so I said to myself, you know, I'm going fishing, I'm going to write about something else. <laughs> right, write about fishing. Uh, but of course, uh, things weren't, weren't not, it didn't work out like that. And uh, it's some very clever, uh, you know, Someone said trends are everything, and there's some trends out there, there that would turn back the clock. Uh, the voucher system uh, in the public schools, uh, uh, and they, they hit upon the. At first, they, they bust the kids from dark to dark uh, all across the counties, and so the kids arrived home crying, and. Uh, the parents were soon turned against this business of busing to, to achieve integration. And then they said, well, what about, we, let's go back to the concept of neighborhood schools and parental involvement and PTA and all these things. So all of these things were, you might say, sold or forced upon uh, South, so that resegregation has taken place to a degree. And where that will end, I don't know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's happening simultaneously with more immigration, so, so I think there's uh, hope. Mm -hmm. uh, here in St. Augustine, uh, well, in, in Paris in the 50s when I was spending time with Richard Wright and seeing how a mixed couple, so-called so uh, African uh, uh, men and French women couples married, pushing baby carts and so on. I said to myself, it'd be a thousand years before America ever reached that point. And uh, lo and behold, uh, it's only been a half century. Mm -hmm. And of all places, uh, St. Augustine, which was one of the last big hotspots, uh, has become something of a mecca for or so-called mixed, mixed couples, mm -hmm. no one was an umbrella. So change is possible. I, I've sometimes likened it uh, to the fact that we stopped using spittoons and stopped blowing horns and uh, various other things that we have stopped smoking. Uh -huh. so, uh, so social change of those dimensions uh, do do happen. Do happen. So. I, when, I, when I was working at uh, Anti-Defamation League, mm -hmm. uh, the same period as the Southern Exposure, uh, I had the notion of, of you know, American fadism, uh, hula hoops or something, everybody has their own yo-yo. I said, let's make it a, a use, use the psychology and, and create what I call frown power. So that anybody using the N word or something, instead of people giggling or something, you uh, should give them dirty looks. And the ADL put some people to work on it for the for cards in, in the subway system. Mm -hmm. I think eventually in billboards along the roadside. So that my idea of frown power, I I took root and uh, it was one of the things I felt most good about. Stetson, you mentioned Richard Wright. Um, do you remember when you first read Native Son, what kind of Im impact the, the book had on you? Well, we, we were, you know, I was a young writer and he was a bit older, I believe, but <clears throat> we were both on the Writers Project and he was in Chicago and I was in Jacksonville. And I was writing these uh, oral histories, really, and so on about uh, black short stories. And I would send them to Richard Wright in Chicago to check my so-called black English. In those days, 
we hadn't really left the old school of Uncle Remus and just that these dim doughs, even black writers were writing like that. After the white audience, like, you know, it, it's a put down. So, um, in, in any case, I did that was right, and he would reply, you know, politely, everything's okay. But uh, in, 50, in the mid 50s, I spent uh, two or more years uh, almost in daily company with him. We had, went to the same cafe, Torno, on the left bank, and did a lot of things together. And he said some very interesting things, like uh, it, it, taken, it took me five years of getting lost in the greenness of Paris before I could stop thinking and seeing everything in black and white. And I remember someone set up a conference in Miami, a Western Hemisphere conference on it, on uh, uh, what is, what's the word for it? Negritude. Uh huh. Blackness. And I remember that conversation with Richard saying that he had been involved in the beginning with the leaders, and he was afraid that it was going to turn into a mystic. So he had dropped a lot of his interest in it. Um, there's a lot of untold stories I need to write, at least some articles about right, because just before he died, he called me and my wife at the time to a cafe and unburdened himself for more than an hour of monologue about a plot to kill him and me and I forget, one, maybe one or two others, a plot funded uh, by the CIA and to be carried out there's a fellow named Brown in Paris who handled all the CIA money for buying elections and starting new parties and stuff all over Europe. It was, it was a focal point for, for CIA funding to disrupt, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to try to elect, a, 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 you know, American-friendly. Uh, and that usually meant anti-labor and anti-democratic and so on. Mm -hmm. All these rotten eggs. So that was, uh, you know, what Richard told me, and I, my memory is so bad I don't remember all of it, and I keep thinking I'll contact that, that wife and see if she remembers more, because it's a certain history, and the history books are full of speculation as to whether there was a plot, uh, whether he was killed. Yeah. You know, he or she has an intention about why to write the book. What was, what was your your main intention? Well, I must say that, for one thing, uh, it was not to really to make money or a best. My first wife, in fact, a Key, Key West girl, used to say, can't you just write one bestseller and, and then, then get on with all this lynching and stuff? And uh, I, my agent at the time, very devoted, and I was sending all these short stories about lynching hard sell, you know, impossible to sell, but she, she, she tried. And uh, she said, people don't want to read think articles. You imagine that, I said, telling that to a 20 year old author. Right. Americans don't want to read think articles. So anyway, that's what uh, I was born into. And it's even worse now, in my opinion. Uh -huh. So, uh, in Palmetto Country, my first book was, you know, by invitation from Caldwell. Mm -hmm. And I rather doubt if, if he hadn't invited me to write that book, I don't know what would have become of my uh, writing, uh, you know, lifetime of writing. It wasn't a career in terms of being successful, in terms of circulation or anything, but uh, rather in the hope of making some kind of constructive changes in what was going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And in the case of uh, Southern Exposure, its dual purpose was exposing the wartime uh, Klan and uh, other racist terrorist groups inside America. So it, to an extent it did that, 
And I was still undercover in them at the time it went to press. Yeah. So there's not any hint that the information about all these uh, racist terrorist groups was obtained by me uh, through infiltration. Mm -hmm. But it, it was all of it. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I was uh, felt that the time was right for raising all these standards. We had the example of the Durham Statement and the, the couch book uh, that failed for, from his point of view. And this pamphlet uh, put out about the South being the number one problem. So that I felt it was a time for raising standards. And therefore, there is a chapter in there called Total Equality and how to get it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that in 1946 was, you know, uh, a revolutionary. The, you know, the KKK and the FBI were totally agreed that anybody who opposed segregation was subversive. And the truth is, we were, I was as subversive as I could be. <laughs> uh, because I was out to overthrow white rule. And uh, they never put it in those words, but uh, that's what we were doing, and we were, in that sense, uh, doing our best to uh, subvert. In fact, you start the chapter by referencing the book, What the Negro Wants. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah. I'd forgotten. Yeah. So these these things were in the wind, and... A large number of people, white and black, were sort of patrolling the Jim Crow wall. The way later, the Berlin Wall got patrolled, you know, looking for cracks or breaks or something. And we were working on it with sledgehammers and crowbars to see if we could find cracks we could widen. Yeah. And, and in fact, uh, succeeded in, in doing so. There were many victories along the way in the in the 40s and 50s that, uh, that made the... Um, overcoming of the 60s uh, less bloody. Um, I call it the, my generation the vanguard generation, so to speak. They were, we were in there uh, doing whatever we could. Uh, uh, you know, I call it softening up the South for righteousness. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, in, in my case and other people too, had to do with uh, in addition to things like feudalism and chain gang and so forth, uh, had to do with um, uh, the lack of democracy in the South, mm -hmm. how to uh, overcome the barriers to, to voting. So much of my time was spent on that. Uh, a monograph I wrote in Georgia on the poll tax, uh, I have a letter from there. Uh, Southern Electoral Reform League has sponsored it. That the president of the, of the Senate had used my monograph in its entirety as his, uh, that's what he had to say in introducing a federal anti poll tax bill. Mm -hmm. He just read my monograph, mm -hmm. sat down. So there were things like that where we were gratifying that, of course, we didn't pass a federal bill. But uh, it scared the states into doing it themselves. Yeah. Stetson, one of the things that really strikes me when I'm reading Southern Exposure again is, you know, you have talked very eloquently about racial inequality. And in this book, in Southern Exposure, you talk equally powerfully about class inequality and, and the, the economy and the importance of, of economic inequality. Um, how did you come up with that, that critique of, of the society? Well, I think I already said something about uh, the, by paying blacks the, low, the lowest wage scale, they were able to uh, hold down the white wage scales, and the re that added up to a regional wage differential, which was a damper on, on wage levels all across the country. And during the same period toward the end of the, the war, the, uh, I guess the history books reflect that the big unions put up many millions of dollars for what they called Operation Dixie, and they were going to come south and get lo local black and white workers and train them to be organizers and organize black and white workers in the same union. 
And when Grand Dragon Green, Samuel Green in Atlanta heard that, he said, we will, we will fight horror with horror. So he, he was looking upon the black and white in the same union as, as horror. And so there'd be a counter-terrorist uh, campaign on the part of the Klan, which took the form of drive-by dynamiting of union halls and beating up of the organizers and so on. So I was right in the thick of all that, and uh, a fellow named Horace White was textile. I probably weighed 260 pounds. They beat him to a pulp, mm. and he was in the hospital, and I went to see him, and, and he says, yes, and he knew what I was, I was infiltrating, he said, if for God's sake be careful, the lowest down, the meanest sons of bitches on the face of the earth. And if they catch you, they'll kill you. A lot of those organizers would be beaten up one night, and, uh, you know, and the plant closed. And be right back there the next morning, all bloody and handing up more leaflets. A lot of real heroes. Trying to unionize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. Jim, Jim Crow God was that my third book? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you a couple of questions, well, Stetson. This the 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 photograph that's on the cover of this book has always amazed me. Yeah, I show this photograph to my students. Yeah, and it just kind of blows them away. Can yeah. you tell me how how this photograph came to be <laughs> and why why it ended up on the cover? Well, I uh, have in my files in the back room a letter from. Uh, various, I think, federal and state officials uh, taking note of it and uh, wondering what what jurisdiction, what what can they do about it. It was there for, I think, quite some years. And uh, the question had to do with, was the sign on the right-of-way at all? Uh, did, did anybody have jurisdiction on the soil that was put on? And I think they concluded that it was not in the pub public right away. It was in private property. Okay. So they went back and forth about the thing. And finally got it taken down. Uh, I forget now how I, the photograph came into my position. I remember showing it to a black professor uh -huh. at uh, Gainesville. Uh -huh. I, I was thinking about what to put on the cover. Yeah. And I said, what, what do you, how do you feel about that? He said, well, it was certainly getting my attention. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where I came from. Yeah, and the students, when they see this, uh -huh. it really, they, they sit up straight in their seats. Uh -huh. It really demands your attention. Yeah. And it's an incredible educational yeah, tool. Yeah, yeah. You know. I'm glad it's good to hear all this. Oh, in the case of Jim Crow Guide, uh, you may have noticed that the, the format is consist in the main of uh, for each each area of segregation where it applied, and that was just everything. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a law or regulation or a custom or etiquette a governing conduct in any given situation. Yeah, between whites and blacks. And Native Americans. That's the thing that's impressed me about this book, Stetson, is uh, you have a whole chapter, you know, your chapter titled No Room for uh, Redskins. Yeah. An Indian magazine up upstate New York reprinted it in their newspaper. Uh, it was quite something, you know. The, uh, I recall a statement by, one, I think, one of the US, United States officers of some kind saying that in, in dealing with... Uh, Wild men, as in dealing with wild animals, uh, no question of morality is involved. Mm -hmm. So there, that's where that fellow was coming from. Yeah. And you have one of the earliest critiques of Christopher Columbus that I've read um, here in the very beginning of this chapter. And you talk about genocide, which is another thing which academics never would have talked about. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about one of the amazing stories, Stetson, that I've heard heard you talk about briefly before is the United States 
But this, I guess the State Department made a statement leading up to a UN conference on forced labor. Uh. And the U.S. State Department said something to the effect that, hey, the United States, we don't have forced labor. Well, right? it's uh, quite an extensive story. It, it took some time to unfold. And it happened in, I believe, 52. And I was busy clearing land up at Belusa Hatchie Park in St. John's County here. And came out from the mud, read in the Florida Times Union a small squib saying that the UN Commission on Forced Labor had convened in New York City and was adjourning Sine Die because no witness had been forthcoming about any forced labor anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. So I sent a Western Union telegram offering to fly a plane load of uh, forced laborers from my neighborhood uh, to New York. And I got a reply saying they'd already adjourned, which if I could come to Geneva, Switzerland, I was living in Switzerland, Florida, and get to Geneva, Switzerland at my own expense in 10 days, they would hear me. I said, well, may I bring in a plane load of forced laborers? And no, uh, they would just hear me as an expert witness. So I raced all around the territory here. Uh, Spuds and Hastings and, and uh, Julington Creek and uh, other nearby Turpentine camps and so on. I uh, was a, a reporter and got these testimonials. And uh, Hitchhiked to Miami. I had no money at all. You hitchhiked? Hitchhiked to Miami and appealed to the Black Ministerial Alliance uh, for help in getting to Geneva. And one man, one pastor pulled out a $5 bill and held on. said, hell, we can't buy freedom for $5. I'm going back to my congregation and take up a love offering. So they all went and took up love offerings and, and got me. Uh, I ended up in New York with a one-way ticket and eight dollars left over. So that's how I, I got to, to Geneva. And the fellow, it was winter and I had no overcoat. Uh, and the fellow, one fellow took me to the airport, a friend of mine, I can't call his name now. Uh, important labor person and uh, he just took off his coat and put it on me and I, it was so large it covered up my hands entirely you know <laughs> touching the ground so that's that's how i arrived in geneva and this old squad of of uh, cia just standing in the, in the, uh, on the platform to look me over you know and they, when they saw me in that coat they couldn't help but laugh <laughs> they all got to giggle. Oh, I never saw them again. Or they probably saw me. Um, it was very gratifying recently. I'm going through some uh, FBI files, um, and uh, among other things, complete you know dossiers on you know this testimony by Kennedy and. Uh, no telling where it's going. This is State Department. State Department. No telling what's going to come of it, and we don't know what the commission's going to report to the UN. And uh, so we're issuing the following uh, white paper saying we admit that there are bad conditions in some areas, but we are working on it and making good progress. <laughs> so that was American uh, position. See, in preparation for the report which is coming up. Uh -huh. The Russians, I just learned, I never seen noticed it before. Uh, instead of a white paper, they released thousands of prisoners in seven different categories as a prelude to this thing. You know, I guess I thought that, that would really make an impression. But anyway, it was a result of uh, what I had done. I was very glad to see it happen. But before that, before you brought that testimony, the United States, the position of the U.S. was there was no problem with forced labor or exploitation. You know, the truth is this, this government of ours frequently takes notice of things and does surveys, but uh, the general public doesn't <laughs> read them, and the official doesn't uh, 
you know, they're just another survey and they're on the shelf. So, yeah, I, it's on the shelf. Because that's what struck me, Stetson, is is when you put that that your testimony together, huh? you used some government reports, right? Right, and the European academics said, well, "See the government reports, you know, telling the truth." Yeah, I said, "Yeah, the government reports." Can you believe it? Yeah. Yeah, they sit on the shelf yeah. and they gather yeah. dust, yeah. Yeah. and no yeah. one even knows that they're. I had one of the highlights of my career. Unquote. I was speaking to the graduate students of of uh, Louis Worth at Chicago. Mm. In sociology. Oh yeah, yeah. And somewhere in my remarks, I referred to sociology as a frustrated science. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at the end of the thing, Doctor Worth raised his hand. He said, "Mr. Kennedy, you said it was a frustrated science. Uh, what would you recommend for sociology?" And I said, "A survey on how to implement surveys." <laughs> 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 and, and the kids all liked it so much. Uh, and I, I got a call uh, at the hotel the next morning from one of the little girls. She said, we just thought you'd like to know that after you left, we made Dr. Burr stay up all night changing the curriculum. And this morning we've thrown a picket line around Marshall Field wow. <laughs> for not, not hiring black clerks. Wow. Uh, That's a great story. I, you know, yeah, I hope it took, took root that it spread beyond worse curriculum. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, because so much, so often, academics will end up studying something, and but then never. Well, the chasm, chasm between government and and uh, scholarship, uh, you know, it's it's almost total. It's like worse than the Berlin Wall. There's just no uh, officialdom is paying little or no attention to what academia is doing. Doesn't give a damn, uh, you know. Just so they don't make trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, uh, I, I, at a very early age, they were talking about social, social get lag, that you, somebody would invent something that would change the whole world mm -hmm. and take the world or anybody else like seven years to wake up to the fact that this thing can do, you know, fix things. Yeah. And it just, it just takes two X time for something to catch on. And in the case of the government, I noticed, I couldn't help but notice in Switzerland, for example, I think it was Bern, the daily papers, or nearly, I don't recall, photographs, but monographs written by heads of departments at the university. They're talking instead of some damn fool boy, they had the head of the department at the university writing uh, on, on whatever the news was. And uh, I said to myself, it'll be a, that's another case of a thousand years before the Florida Times Union calls up the University of North Florida and <laughs> for, for 500 words about five o'clock or something. But uh, it was a revelation. It's one of the sad facts of life that there, that there is no interface between academia and government. And that's an exaggeration, of course, but relatively speaking, it's true. Stetson, I'm looking at the, you know, the Jim Crow guide, and we've talked about the, the testimony that you gave before the UN Commission on Forced Labor, and you put this book together in a guidebook format. Uh -huh. Was that something that came from your WPA experience? Was that your? I don't know what you know when when or how the idea came to me, but uh, I thought at the time that it would be a, a powerful way of presenting the, the information. You pretend it was a mock serious guidebook and if you're black, uh, you better not do this, that, and the other thing, or you're likely to be shot on the spot or whatever. And I, I developed a format of, of every given, I say every, uh, as many as possible situations and the applicable statute or ordinance uh, governing that uh, action and, and behavior in those circumstances. And then a typical case history of a person being arrested or, or mobbed uh, because of that particular violation. Mm -hmm. And then the history of the adjudication of it 
so that you had the whole thing from the, the statutory authority uh, all the way down through a typical case and the, the judgment and punishment imposed. So that's it was a format applied to virtually throughout the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still like to think it was effective. Uh, I recall uh, I was at a writer's conference in uh, Bucharest, it was, I think, and there was a delegate from India. And somebody said, you the, you the, you the one who wrote Jim Crow Guide? I said, yes. And he said, bitter, bitter, bitter. Mm. That's all he said. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the director of the Black History Museum over at uh, Florida A&M, what's his name, uh, he was, showed me his copy. He said, this was our Bible for me and my boys when, when we were marching. And so oh, was, uh, James Eton? Was, hmm? was it James Eton? Yeah. Yeah, he had been director. Wow. So he said, this, this was our Bible when we were on the march. And uh, it was translated into probably, I haven't counted recently, but I think 16 or 18 languages. Mm -hmm. I... Uh, you know, there were those who said I should you know, criticism should stop at the water's edge and so on. But I didn't have a buy into that concept. It is, it's, the world's much too small for yeah. that kind of thinking. So that apartheid, for example, in South Africa is certainly just as much our concern as vice versa and so yeah. on. But anyhow, I made up my mind and did my very best to give Uncle Sam a hot foot. <laughs> uh, all, you know, all across the horizon, uh -huh. and tried to try to get this thing into print, and, and it ended up in all these strange places, Indonesia, and uh, you know I didn't even know they published it, must just get paid or anything, but uh, the newspapers were serializing it. Here in this country, I couldn't find a book publisher, uh, but the newspaper PM in Manhattan called itself a newsman's newspaper and no advertising. And a, a very fine paper indeed. Um, it serialized the Jim Crow Guide. Mm -hmm. And otherwise it was, and well, the, the Baltimore Afri Afro-American newspaper serialized. So except for those two serializations, uh, the American public didn't get to know about the Jim Crow Guide until a half century later. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the University of Florida Press uh, deserves credit for, you know, uh, they were buried alive, so to speak, and, and the Florida University Press uh, dug them up. Uh, the circumstances were interesting. Uh, Dr. Ann Henderson, then uh, head of the Florida Humanities Council, mm -hmm. she was talking in a group about, somebody mentioned Stetson Kennedy, and she said, he's still alive. And, yeah, he's still alive. And so here comes Ann Henderson up to Beluth High. And, and uh, she brought uh, Dr. George Bedell, the director of the press at the time, there too. And Dr. Raymond Mould, in history at the Florida Atlantic at the time, mm -hmm. was involved in, in pushing the idea of, of the university publishing my four, four books. And uh, with good reason, perhaps, the, you know, the press didn't want, they wanted to print all except Southern exposure. You know, a lot of statistics in there and stuff, and uh -huh. statistics are dated sometimes. And, but Raymond Mole said, no, it's, uh, together they constitute a corpus uh, that gives us a picture of life in America not to be found anywhere else. You need to publish all four. So that's what. University did, mm -hmm. and it, it, ever since then, uh, the, the, they went into uh, the university press. Did a beautiful job for, for a very long time, many years. But when they finally went out of print, uh, I, with Sandra's help, uh, we've been busy getting uh, you know new publishers. So in this case, uh, the University of Alabama Press has uh, brought back. Uh, all four of the books. Oh, I noticed that. Yeah, that's interesting. There, and that's a really good press. Really yeah. Good press. 
if, if he, let me see, the, the Klan book, as uh, you know, we're talking about a half century. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty long time for a book to be in, you know, in, in there were vacant periods when it was out of print, but, uh, yeah. but uh, for example, the, uh, the French edition of the Klan book is back in print. Uh, also, the, the guide in French edition, and the German and the Chinese, fifty years after the first appearance, back in print. Yeah. One so, of the things I found, and when I've traveled, is sometimes there's people are more interested in American race relations in Europe or Japan or uh, than they are in the U.S. More interested. Yeah. More interested in their own race relations. Even more interested in what's happening in oh, the in U.S. in America. Huh? For example, let me give you one example. Recently, um, a friend sent me a clipping. Well, and they said they put up a in Belfast. People had created a wonderful mural of Frederick Douglass, and someone asked me, "Well, would this happen in the U.S.? Would anyone put up a big mural of Frederick Douglass yeah. in downtown Jacksonville?" I said, "Uh, I don't know, but they did it in Belfast. Uh -huh. That was interesting." Yes, that's, that's of course uh, in a case in point for my contention that, that it's uh, questions of morality and affecting human rights uh, on mass uh, are by definition global concerns. Yeah. Um, I was in France that I first encountered the expression that the United States is an integrally racist nation. I said, what in the hell do French mean when they say we're integrally racist? And the obvious answer is that uh, government and institutions are all uh, committed to and, and practicing uh, gross racial discrimination. So it was not just some peripheral uh, phenomenon or problem in psychology. Uh, the nation was was locked into a racist program which was buttressed by all kinds of legislation and all kinds of litigation. Yeah. So we were as much a racist nation, as you might say, as, as Hitler's Third Reich. It was, it was part and parcel of, of the government uh, philosophy. And Stetson, it just strikes me um, that your approach, when you wrote Southern Exposure, Jim Crow Guide was a, was different than the approach taken by someone like you know Gunnar Myrdal uh, in his study about race. What did you think about his his approach and how yours? You know, it's been a long time, and I remember American dilemma. I remember at the yeah. time, you know, the, the amount of research and money that went into the Myrdal study, and uh, it's sort of laboring uh, the mountain, laboring and bringing forth a mouse. I couldn't find any uh, substantive conclusions in, it to the, in the thing. Uh -huh. uh, I, I think I made some saying about as as for the you know the Myrdal report. Let it be said that few studies have had so many facts at their disposal or reached so many uh, erroneous conclusions based upon them, mm. and. Uh, because that was, Mir you know, Myrdal's thing was, well, America was a democratic society, but there was this minor problem with racism. Well, he didn't say minor, but he said there's this problem with racism. But as soon as we get that cleared up, then everything will be back to... Well, my recollection is, like I say, I've forgotten what the thing said. But uh, my recollection, it was far from being, uh, you know, a militant denunciation and so on. Yeah. As I recall, it had to do with, you know, uh, education. And that's, that, of course, all of the pillars of racism in the South and elsewhere took the position that uh, racism is a prejudice, is a matter of the heart, and therefore cannot be legislated. The uh, only thing we can do is hope that education will someday get prejudice out of the hearts of people. And of course, that meant they, they didn't ever, they didn't, they, that, that meant no change. Yeah. Uh, the world's not going to last that long. Mm. So I would argue in, in, in a way of a 
replied to that contention that um, perhaps we, we cannot legislate matters of the heart, but we can, we can legislate about the experience of living and studying and working and traveling and so on together. Mm -hmm. And that experience is highly educational. So that we should, you know, I was arguing that we, we, we put a stop to segregation in all those areas of human activity. Oh, you get to do, you know, some real education, you know, in terms of on-the-job training, so to speak. On-the-job training, yeah. yeah, against racism. Yeah, there you go. Well, well, Stetson, I know we've taken up a lot of your time, but I, uh, I just had um, one more question for you. I, you know, we talked in the beginning about your intent of writing the books huh? and Southern Exposure, Jim Crow Guide, and I was. It reminded me of a statement that Upton Sinclair made years ago, and I think it was after he published The Jungle. He made the statement that I was aiming at America's uh, heart and I hit it in the stomach or something like that. And I wonder if you, when you think about these books, did they, did they um, impact people the way you wanted people to be impacted by them, uh, by the books? Uh, what's your assessment as, as the author? Well, uh, when Obama was, uh, won the election, my telephone started to ring, and friends and strangers saying, congratulations. I said, well, what, you know, what for? The Obama election. I said, well, I, I wasn't connected with the campaign. They said, oh, yes, you were. You've been working on it for 73 years already. And uh, uh, the fact that more than that many people had, had the same idea, I don't know if I would have ever thought of it, but, uh, Ended up saying that on NPR. They somehow they got wind of it. And uh, I think it's very true that a large number of whites and blacks who fought against segregation, uh, you know, uh, as far back as the record goes, there have been people standing up against it, but in the th uh, 30s and 40s, 50s. Um, the cumulative effect of all that was, uh, you know, manifest in, in the Obama election. Um, and I think that remains, a, you know, of course, an, an historic landmark, no matter how the guy performs. Mm -hmm. uh, there, it's, its value from that point of view remains. Mm -hmm. Nothing can take it away. Every black kid in America can walk around saying, I could, I could be president too. Yeah. And before that election, it was only us white kids could do that. Well, Stetson, is there anything that you'd like to, to add um, in addition to what you've, you've so eloquently been uh, saying? You no, know, well, my concern at, at present is the extent to which, uh, you know, I come out of this background of a century of uh, the feudalism and, and peonage and all the rest uh, and racism. Uh, the uh, forms of oppression and exploitation have changed. And uh, this is characteristic of, of human history that, that the form changes, but the exploitation goes on. And now for the 21st century, it appears that that's not feudalism. Uh, uh, we've got a far more serious and uh, possibly unsolvable problem of corporate control over government and institutions. And when you get any single group, a powerful group, possessed of vast sums of money uh, in a position to dictate to, to government. I, I've been saying, yeah, money talks, but mega books dictate. And uh, that's the condition. I think we in the, much of the world are in today that this grip of corporate control. And it goes without saying that the Pentagon 
to pretty much do anything the CEOs tell them to. Uh, so how to, how to get at the problem of corporate. Uh, Lincoln's thing, formula about government all by and for the people has been supplanted by government all by and for the corporations. Mm -hmm. And the problem is how to change that. Not easy. Because above all, they they are effectively controlling the public mind more effectively than any uh, potentate, uh, pope, or uh, dictator of any kind ever thought of doing. And uh, uh, we're precluded from thinking. Uh, seeing through the realities of American politics. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why we need to continue reading Southern Exposure and Jim Crow Guide. And we've all been fixed like our cats, you know. We, <laughs> can't, <laughs> right, right. we can't possibly vote right. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Well, Stetson. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's been an honor oh, to oh, talk oh, with you. Oh, and, and we'll continue uh, later in the summer when when the weather allows and. We'll look forward to talking with you again. Yeah, I like it.